Hello and welcome to lecture 16 for the course uh, ECE 257A, Fault Tolerant Computing. Uh, this is the last lecture for the course and it will cover chapters 26 and 28 in the textbook and a little bit of the appendix that uh, covers some miscellaneous topics including a history of dependable computing. So let's start with chapter 26, uh, dealing with failure recovery. <clears throat> okay, failure recovery basically means uh, that uh, a failure has occurred despite all the provisions and uh, preventive uh, measures and then we have to deal with that failure uh, and uh, the way to deal with failure is to recover from it basically deal with the consequences of the failure and try to return the system to normal operation uh, through various means and it's important for dealing uh, in dealing with failures recovering from failures is to have documented plans and have trained personnel. So what do we mean by this? Well, uh, you can't leave uh, dealing with failures and recovering from failures to chance or to uh, basically incentives and uh, ingenuity of the personnel. You actually have to explicitly train them we're dealing with this and in fact since uh, about a decade or even more ago major uh, uh, computer companies uh, especially in e-commerce have started to have uh, basically drill uh, dates disaster drill dates which means they actually purposely introduce some problem into their system and then have the personnel deal with those problems according to the procedures that are given in manuals and books to see how they handle it and if there are any weaknesses in handling uh, failure and recovering from the failure then they'll sort of go back and adjust their plans or provide additional training to the personnel of course, you know, a site such as Amazon or Google cannot afford to introduce some, you know, totally random, arbitrary failure and hope hope that the personnel can deal with it. So they plan for it. So they say, for example, on such and such date, there will be some problems in the system and you have to deal with it. And so that they, they have some warning. Okay, but other than that, the nature of the problem that occurs uh, is not given to the personnel, and they have to figure out what went wrong and try to cope with it. This problem can be uh, confined to part of the system rather than you know bring down the entire system so that uh, the commercial operations of the system are not affected while personnel get some uh, need a training in how to deal with such uh, disasters. So this is part of the training of the personnel of such companies uh, to be able to deal with unexpected events, things that, that can go wrong. That training and also documented plans for how to deal with such problems is uh, uh, a requirement. Okay, I'm going to skip some slides in the interest because we have a lot of material to cover today in this lecture. So these are some of the terms that are used in connection with failures and recovery from them. Uh, on the left side of the slide, you see the terms fail slow, fail soft, fail safe. On the right side, you see fail fast, fail hard, fail stop. And we'll define these in a bit more detail 
uh, in the coming slides. And then in the middle, these are the terms that are often used, failover and failback. A fail forward is also a term that exists, but it's I have not seen it used uh, in connection with computing. It's, it, it's used in some other fields. Okay, so what are these terms? <clears throat> it is true that subtle failures, especially in systems that are very complex, are difficult to detect. Therefore, they can be worse than overt ones that are immediately noticed. So I sometimes jokingly say that if, if the failure is such that the computer starts uh, emitting smoke or you see fire, then you immediately know that something is wrong and you shut down the computer or do something. Whereas a subtle failure is uh, some zero somewhere in the memory changing to one, which is not immediately noticeable, but it can have pretty disastrous consequences. So subtle failures are difficult to detect. And uh, whereas overt failures uh, that are more obvious are in a way more desirable because you want those kinds of failures to occur so that you notice them quickly and deal with them. Okay, so we need to aim for designing systems so that the failures are difficult to miss. And these are known as fail-hard systems, as opposed to fail-soft systems, which fail softly, and therefore you may not immediately notice that something went wrong. Okay, a corollary of this principle is that unneeded system complexity must be avoided at all costs. And I have talked about avoiding complexity before. This is one more instance where uh, that principle of avoiding complexity comes into play. Because complex systems tend to have a lot of subtle failure modes and which are difficult to detect by nature. Okay, also extended failure detection Latency is undesirable. So if a failure occurs, and it takes you five minutes to detect it, that's undesirable. You want to be able to quickly detect failures. And this leads to the term fail fast systems. So the system from the time that something goes wrong to the time that it actually fails, and we know this failure, uh, the amount of time that elapses is very short. So <clears throat> you quickly observe, check the failure. And of course, concurrent fault, error, or malfunction detection is better than periodic testing. Periodic testing by nature means every once in a while you test the system to see if something is wrong. So depending on that period, the period of testing, it may take a while for you to notice that something is wrong. For example, if you test the system every one minute, okay, it's possible that you don't notice a failure um, until one minute after it has occurred because the, the, the test time may not arrive uh, within that one minute. Okay, fail-stop systems are systems that are designed and built in such a way that they cease to respond or to take any action upon internal malfunction detection. So this is basically an instance of uh, a fail-safe system. So we'll talk about fail-safe systems in some detail in chapter 28. Uh, fail-stop systems are sort of a kind of fail-safe system because if they stop, they don't take any action, they don't provide any data to us, that's sort of safe because we won't be using incorrect data. The computer will not be taking any incorrect actions when something goes wrong. So it's good to design systems so that they basically shut down, stop when something goes wrong in them. As I mentioned, that these are uh, these form a subclass 
of fail-safe systems that we'll talk about later. The notion of failover is particularly relevant in uh, places where they have a large number of servers. So at any given time, a server is attending to a customer. Let's say at Google, a server is processing a customer's uh, search request. At Netflix, uh, a server is streaming a particular video to that user. Okay. Now, if that server fails so that it can no longer do its job, a failover is a mechanism by which uh, we basically transfer functions and the tasks of that failed server to a different server so that it can continue uh, serving the customer. Okay, uh, so this term failover means uh, when something fails, the tasks are sent over to a different server, a different hardware resource. Now, in the case of uh, video streaming, this is pretty easy to do because when a server at Netflix is serving a video to you, you're watching a video, <laughs> basically the only relevant information is which video you're watching and at which point of that video you currently are what point of the video are you watching so if that server fails and we have to transfer the task to a different server only two pieces of information need to be given to that new server and the two pieces are the identity of the video that was being streamed and the point at which failure occurred so that the new server can. So in this case, failover is very simple because a minimum amount of information needs to be transferred to the new server. In other cases, it may not be as simple. A lot of data must be transferred so that the new server can resume, can, can work, do the work of the failed server. Modern operating systems have failover mechanisms built in. So, for example, uh, Windows XP, this particular site that you see here, um, has some features built in, and newer versions of Windows, of course, have even more extensive failover uh, capabilities. Okay. So I'm going to skip this slide, which provides some details of this failover mechanism in Windows. Uh, one of the most important uh, aspects of dealing with failures and recovering from them is the human component, human interface. And here's a quote that is one of my favorites. And no warning system will function effectively if its messages, however logically arrived at, are ignored, disbelieved, or lead to inappropriate action. These warning systems, whether they're for computer failures or other natural disasters and so on, have to be made believable. So if you are in a building and the fire alarm goes off, you know, every three hours because somebody plays with it then you start disbelieving that uh, alarm and then when a real fire occurs you may think you know something is um, it's not a serious problem and you may ignore it and this is basically why whenever there's a fire drill and they sound the alarm just for practice it's important for everybody to leave the building uh, because, for example, if they tell you we'll have a fire drill tomorrow at 10 a.m., and then maybe at 9.30 a real fire occurs, you may think that that's just a drill. And so if for drills you don't leave the building, you may get in trouble. So in the case of fire alarms, uh, the authorities insist that everybody leave the building, even though we know it's a drill just in case, okay? 
So there's a very uh, important example of this disbelief in uh, warnings. The, it's a, uh, over here. Okay, in Hawaii, uh, in May 1960, a tsunami occurred, and people were given a 10-hour advance warning through sirens. So people had 10 hours to basically leave their place as if they were unsafe and get to a safe place. Despite this advance warning, 61 people were killed and this was primarily because people just did not believe the warnings okay so it's important for the warnings to be believable and be given in a way that you know creates uh, trust in people that are being warned and of course warnings must be helpful and provide sufficient information so in uh, automobiles, this is my favorite. So sometimes a warning light goes on that says check engine. Very vague. It doesn't say, you know, how serious the problem might be. Do I need to just stop my car right now and not drive it? Or, you know, I can just take it for a check uh, next week. This doesn't give you any information about how serious the, the problem is. In the case of computer systems, uh, it used to be, we don't have this very often nowadays. Uh, on the screen, you read fatal error, nothing else, no more information about what happened, how you need to deal with it, you know, what, what is the fix, just fatal error, and a very vague and unhelpful warning uh, given to, to the user. Now, uh, of course, when automation efforts are highly successful, this is sometimes sometimes creates uh, uh, basically a lax attitude towards safety. A good example that I have not on here is for self-driving cars these days. You know, pretty soon uh, all computer, all, all car manufacturers will introduce self-driving cars. And the first models will likely require the driver to be there. Okay, it's not completely self-driving. It's mostly self-driving, but as a safety uh, uh, precaution, the driver should be there in case something goes wrong and the driver has to take over. Now, if these self-driving cars are rather successful, and the driver basically seldom has to do anything or almost never has to do anything, then the human operator tends to switch off in these cases. Okay, after a few hours of driving and nothing goes wrong, you tend to switch off and basically not pay attention. Therefore, if something does go wrong, then you are not prepared, uh, you're not in a prepared mental state to take over. So the, if, if a human operator is necessary, then there, we should provide some mechanism to make sure that the human operator is engaged and therefore can take over at the moment's notice. Oops. Okay, backing up data is... Uh, an important aspect of recovering from failures. And unfortunately, despite repeated warnings, many people actually do not back up their data. Now, if data is um, you know, photos and other things, uh, and you lose them, well, it's, it's not disastrous, of course, some, some people, uh, you know, become distraught when they lose a whole bunch of photos that represent memories. 
but it's not something that causes lack of safety if you lose them. But in other cases, data, uh, preserving the data may have safety implications, and that data we have to make sure is preserved. We have backup copies of it in case it disappears as a result of computer failure. Now, personally, we all do backups to various extent. Uh, we may use removable storage, external hard drive or flash drive or CD, DVD uh, to back up our files. Um, it takes some, some work, so a lot of people just ignore backing up the data. Uh, another way that I personally found to be useful is emailing a file copy to myself, which of course is not usable for very large files, but whenever I work on a paper, let's say, let's say a week or two, I, I'm working on refining and finalizing a research paper. Um, once or twice a day, I email a copy of the file to myself and then basically continue working. Um, what I'm doing, I'm essentially using the email server of our department as a backup uh, medium. So when I email a file, that, that email is stored on the email server. Later, I can access, to, uh, access that file if I need it. If my main file disappears or is corrupted, I have at least that version of the file. <clears throat> Okay, of course, there are backup utilities that you can install on your computer where your files are periodically backed up to cloud, and therefore you always have the latest copy of each file. Those usually cost money, so people are less motivated to use them. And uh, one... Uh, practical tip is try not to overwrite files. So it's very tempting. You have a file of a paper you're working on. You just open it and make changes and save it, which means that the previous version of the file basically disappears. Uh, make it a habit to create new versions. So make a copy of the file, give it a new name, and then apply the modifications to that new copy so that you always have a trace of the work that you have done in these previous versions of, of the file. Uh, businesses also need backups for programs and computer resources, not just files. Uh, so if you have purchased a program, uh, you may have to store a backup copy in case the original copy is corrupted. Of course, often nowadays you, you can get a new copy of the program from uh, the, the supplier, the vendor of the program if you need to. Okay, there is an area of uh, computer engineering these days called computer forensics. Uh, that's a field that basically deals with various uh, ways of uh, when a computer fails, uh, trying to determine what went wrong and also be able to extract data from the hard drive or other parts of your file system uh, in order to sort of resume normal operations, perhaps on a different computer. So computer forensics is a rapidly expanding field and things that computer forensic experts do uh, include the following. Analyze computers belonging to defendants uh, who are being prosecuted for various wrongdoing, for legal cases. Uh, if you obtain the laptop or other computer devices from a defendant, experts can go into it and try to see what's there. Not only what's there, but what used to be there, because sometimes even files that are 
erased, have been erased, can be recovered from the computer. And gather evidence against those suspected of wrongdoing. Learn about the system in order to debug, optimize, or reverse engineer it. Okay, so you get your hands on a particular new computer model uh, from a rival company, and you look into it with the aim of reverse engineering it. Or if it's your own computer, you may want to optimize it. Okay, analyze uh, data storage and uh, other aspects of the system in order to optimize the its operation. Um, analyzing compromised computer systems to determine intrusion methods. This is nowadays very important because hacking and intrusion is a major, uh, major problem for many computer users, especially uh, corporate users, because hackers constantly try to disrupt their operations or extract data from their systems. So analyzing a compromised computer system to determine what method was used for intrusion, or perhaps finding out who did the intrusion, that, that's big business these days. <clears throat> Analyze failed computer systems to determine cause of failure. Okay, uh, I showed you uh, in the last lecture various causes of computer failures. You know, how much are attributed to hardware, uh, communications, to storage, and so on. These are determined by forensic experts. So a computer has failed, we go into it, examine it in detail to find out exactly what went wrong. And finally, recover data after computer failures. Uh, your, uh, let's say, uh, laptop crashes and you can't turn it on. Uh, your data is on the hard disk drive and it's relatively easy for an expert to actually recover the data from the hard drive. Uh, provided that you know the computer crash was not due to a hard drive failure, disk crash. But even when there is this crash, parts of the data, so the crash uh, of head, let's say, on the disk can damage a lot of data, but you may still be able to recover some other parts of your data. Of course, this may not be needed if you uh, sort of diligently back up all your, all your data. But if you don't back up, then you have to basically go in and try to recover your data from the damaged disk drive. Okay, there are several journals nowadays on uh, fields that are known as computer forensics, digital investigations, and e-discovery. Okay, so if you search uh, under these terms on Google, you will, you'll be able to uh, locate a bunch of journals that publish research in these areas, and these are very active research areas nowadays. Okay, I showed you this quotation from Henry Petrosky before. It doesn't hurt to remind you of it because it's very important. Uh, Petrosky says, the complex system succeeds, that success masks its proximity to failure. Thus, the failure of the Titanic contributed much more to the design of safe ocean liners than would have her success. That is the paradox of engineering and design. So basically, he's saying, Petrosky is saying that failures are part of the learning process. If all failures are eliminated, then we have, we'll have a hard time, harder time, to learn from our mistakes. So if the Titanic had not sunk, uh, still had all the defects, all the problems that led to its sinking, then we would not have learned about those problems as quickly, and therefore uh, future ocean liners would not have been 
safer. Okay, so here in this and the next slide, I list some very famous failed systems. Uh, and these are mostly systems that never even got started working. In other words, it's not that they worked for a while and then failed. Uh, they basically started in the failed state. Uh, so these are some examples. Let me just uh, mention a few of them. Uh, Elton, Marriott, uh, these are hotel operators. Budget uh, is a car rental company in American Airlines. In 1988, started building a computerized system for hotel reservations that would be linked with airline reservations and car rental reservations. This system was so ambitious, you know, tried to do so many things that after four years, it was scrapped. In other words, they came to the conclusion that it's hopeless and they can't build it after they had spent $125 million on working on it. Okay, and that's not the worst of them. Uh, IBM tried to build an operating system with all sorts of nice features. It was going to be based on Mach 3, an existing operating system. But it had to have, you know, new clock management, a new remote procedure car. They basically tried to do everything a new from scratch, a new I.O. system, a new CPU. The project started in 1991, and after five years, it was scrapped. Again, they decided it was hopeless. It was too ambitious. Uh, they had spent already $2 billion on the project. OK, in this last example, the monetary damage was not that much, but lives were lost. A London Ambulance Dispatch Service, the project start, started working in 1991, and it was scrapped in 1992 because in two days of operation, 20 lives had been lost that could be traced to errors in system operation. Okay, remember I mentioned before that it's very important to limit the scope of the system. Do not introduce too many new technologies and new methods in a system that is safety critical or is important. It's financially you know, a huge system. Uh, if you want it not to fail, you have to do incremental improvements rather than trying to change everything at once uh, and say, I'm going to do everything, you know, uh, as in the IBM system, new clock management system, new remote procedure called new I.O. Everything new and wonderful, but when you put them together, they don't work. Okay, here is an even longer list of various projects that led to failure and the amount of money, the date of the project and the amount of money that was lost because the project never got off the ground. Okay, so let me now go to chapter 28. dealing with fail-safe system design. This is a very important uh, topic. Uh, in safety-critical systems, of course, you try to avoid failures, but the next best thing to avoiding failures is making sure that the failure of the system is safe. And because traffic lights are you know, the, the common examples that are used uh, uh, to illustrate this, so if you have uh, an intersection uh, uh, with two sets of traffic lights, one for each direction at the intersection, 
um, if both sides, both of those lights show red, meaning all traffic stops, that's a safe failure. If both sides show green, that's an unsafe failure because then cars coming from each direction would think that you know, they have the green light, they will drive through the intersection and will have collision. So this uh, picture that I put on the cover of this uh, uh, slide for this chapter is a humorous, uh, basically uh, there's redundancy in the traffic lights in order to make them more reliable. Of course, uh, this is not the way to make the traffic lights more reliable. Okay, so a fail-safe system produces one of a predetermined set of safe outputs when it fails as a result of undesirable events. Okay, events that it cannot tolerate. So there are some things that it can tolerate, that's fine, then it continues working. The things that it cannot tolerate are beyond its tolerance limit. Then we design the system so that it produces one of a predetermined uh, set of safe outputs. Okay, so a fail-safe traffic light will remain stuck in red because red is safe. You know, people stop and then after a couple of minutes they notice that the light is not changing to green. They guess that something is wrong and may proceed with caution, but they won't just drive through the intersection. Uh, you know, um, in the case of green, because that can cause collision. Okay, uh, in uh, gas ranges that we might have at home, there's a pilot flame. That pilot flame basically has a small flame uh, going uh, at all times. And then uh, so whenever you turn on uh, one of the uh, units in your uh, gas range or in furnace, heating furnace, and the pilot flame will light the main, the main uh, burner and you can use uh, the unit. Now, if the pilot is blown off, in other words, the pilot uh, flame goes off, well, there's a danger that gas that is used to light that pilot flame can leak into uh, the house and create danger. Okay, either uh, uh, hurt people or cause an explosion and basically destroy the entire uh, house. So these pilot flames are designed so that when the flame goes off accidentally, uh, uh, that pilot uh, unit pulls off. Okay? It's usually warm because the flame is, uh, is on at all times. But the f when the flame goes off, then the, the unit cools off. And that cooling off causes the valve, the gas valves, to close. So the gas intake will stop, and therefore gas will not leak as a result of the pilot going off. Okay, so this is an example of a fail-safe system. Um, so you won't be able to light your range after that because the pilot has been extinguished and the gas has shut off, but at least the situation is safe. A fail-safe digital system, like uh, in self-checking units we said before, you should have at least two outputs. So if a unit generates uh, the output 0 or 1 under normal condition, and let's say 0 is a safe output because, let's say, it doesn't do anything, and 1 is a unsafe output, if you have just a single line and that line happens to be stuck at 1, then you will have that unsafe condition and you're not able to do anything about it. So as in the case of self-checking units, we should have at least two outputs. And here is an example. 
you can say, okay, zero is represented as zero one on the two output. One is represented as one zero. And the other two combinations indicate some sort of failure, some sort of problem. Okay, in this case, if one of these two lights, uh, lines is stuck, let's say this one is stuck at one, and then the output has to be zero one, you get one one, so you detect the problem. Okay, so unless both of those lines are stuck, which is unlikely, uh, you're okay. It's always safe. Okay. So there is a field of engineering called safety engineering. Uh, in our university at UCSB, uh, the, the Department of Mechanical Engineering has specialists and courses in that field. So in 1987, a long time ago, Jack Goldberg, who was a researcher in fault tolerant computing, basically went and studied the uh, literature of safety engineering and extracted seven principles that we should sort of observe in order to design safe systems. So let me quickly go through these seven principles. Um, you know, if we deal with safety critical systems, it might be a good idea to put these seven principles on a piece of paper or somewhere so that you constantly see them. Uh, principle one, Use barriers and interlocks to constrain access to critical system resources or state. So if there are some critical resources that you should be careful in exercising them, then you should have barriers and interlocks, safety checks before any part of your program or your system accesses those critical resources. And we'll, we'll see an example of this in an example that follows, a traffic light design problem that cover. Perform critical actions, principle two. Perform critical actions incrementally rather than a single step. So when the system is trying to do a critical action and that action has multiple parts, try to perform the action incrementally rather than changing everything all at once because it's uh, more likely that you will observe that something is wrong as you go incrementally through the steps than if you try to change everything at once. Principle three, dynamically modify system goals to avoid or mitigate damages. So as things go wrong in the system, or you, you see, you, either you see that something is going wrong, or you anticipate, you predict that something is about to go wrong, you should modify system goals uh, in order to avoid or mitigate damages. So for example, if you see that the disk drive is sort of behaving badly, it's uh, behaving marginally, uh, perhaps you want to shut that down and uh, adjust the goals of the system so that it doesn't use that disk drive until you have uh, sort of uh, determined what's wrong uh, or fixed the problem. Principle four, manage the resources needed to deal with the safety crisis so that enough will be available in an emergency. Okay, so for example, if you have backup batteries for when power goes off and you want to operate your system uh, when there's no uh, power from the grid, then you better make sure that resources, the batteries that are going to be used to uh, for backup uh, are in top shape, they're fully charged, and so on. Manage them, uh, take care of them, 
if there is extra storage, for example, that you have set aside for emergency, and make sure that that storage is still functional and available, and so on. Principle five, exercise all critical functions and safety features regularly to assess and maintain their viability. Okay, so for example, most cars have one or two spare tires in their trunk uh, that are used when uh, you develop a flat tire. Now, if you leave the spare tires there and not use them for years because you didn't have a flat tire, then when time comes that you need the spare tire, you may go and see that it's flat or it's damaged. You better check those uh, periodically to make sure that those resources uh, needed to deal with a safety crisis uh, are available. And also, you know, exercise means if you have a backup power system, you have to actually use it once in a while, even though you don't need it because power is not off. You actually use it once in a while to make sure that when the need arises, uh, it actually function uh, according to your needs. Okay, principle six, design the operator interface to provide the information and power needed to deal with exceptions. So the operator should be given uh, enough information and enough authority to be able to deal problems as they arise. Uh, principle seven, defend the system against malicious attacks. Of course, in 1987, there were some malicious attacks, but not very many of them. And this has become now one of the major uh, issues in protecting computer systems and making sure that they operate dependably. Make sure that malicious attacks like hacking and uh, hostile takeover of computer systems do not occur. So this principle seven is now a lot more important than it was in 1907 when Goldberg uh, wrote, uh, wrote these principles down. Okay, here is an example of a fail-safe specification, things that can go wrong and many people don't pay attention to it. So here we have a system with input, some inputs that can be given to it. For any particular input, there is a correct output. Okay, so if something goes wrong in the system, and I'll, I'll show you an example here, something goes wrong, then we definitely don't want the system to produce another valid output that is not the correct output. Okay, so this will be avoided. We also don't want the system to produce an unsafe output. That should be avoided. However, we can designate a subset of all outputs as safe outputs and allow the system to produce one of those because that doesn't create any danger. So under internal failures in the system. The system either creates the correct output or it produces one of these, one of the set of safe outputs in this subset, but not an unsafe output or a valid output. By looking at it, you don't know that it's wrong because it's a valid output and there's some other uh, input, some other circumstances. So you won't be able to tell that something has gone wrong here. Whereas when one of these safe outputs is produced, you are able to tell that something is wrong. So this is basically a very simple exercise. Suppose in an amusement park or in a zoo someplace, there is this train that uh, moves on the track. So the track goes from a beginning point to an end point, and the train basically moves from beginning to end and then returns to the beginning and so on. Gives a ride to uh, visitors to the park. Usually children use these trains. Okay. So 
as part of the safety mechanism for this train, there's a sensor at the beginning that asserts the signal S sub B. So sensor for the beginning indicates that the train is at the beginning of the track. And when the train is at the beginning of the track, it will be allowed to move forward, but should not be allowed to go back. So there are interlocking mechanisms in the train's engine <coughs> Excuse me. And that allow it to move forward when it's at the beginning of the track, but it will not allow it to go back because it will basically crash into a building or fall off the track. Okay. Similarly, there is a sensor at the end of the track that senses the presence of the train at the end. And when this signal is asserted by that sensor, indicates that the train is at the end of the track, it can go back, but should not be able to move forward. Okay. So the question is, is this specification complete, adequate? for designing uh, the safety mechanism for this train? The answer is no, because the specifications do not say what happens if both of these signals are asserted. Of course, under normal conditions, the train is either at the beginning or, well, not either. It's at the beginning, at the end, or somewhere else on the track. So at most, one of these two signals can be asserted. If it's at the beginning, this signal is asserted. If at the end, this signal is asserted. If it's somewhere in the middle, neither of those signals is asserted. Okay? So the combinations 0, 0, neither one asserted, 1, 0, and 0, 1, those are all possibilities. 1, 1 is impossible under normal condition. It can occur if one of these sensors is malfunctioning, okay? And in fact, because these sensors are often designed to fail in the safe mode, now safe mode for these signals is to be one, because if the train is at the beginning and this signal is zero, it fails to zero, then that's unsafe. But if it fails to one, that's a safe failure mode. So because these sensors are designed to fail in that safe failure mode where the output is 1, in fact, this is possible. And we have to indicate in the specs what needs to be done in that case. In other words, how do we design train and its control mechanism? How, how should it behave in this case? Okay, so completeness of the specifications, uh, which also consider cases that are not common, are not expected, but do arise as a result of failures, must be uh, specified so that the designer basically knows what to do in those cases. Okay, so let's take a very simple, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, you know, traffic lights are the uh, main examples that are used in describing safety critical systems because everybody is familiar with uh, traffic lights. So uh, let's say we have a very simple traffic light uh, with two sets of lights and there are two basically two intersecting roads. One set of lights uh, are for road one, red, amber, green, and the second set for row two, red, amber, green. As I mentioned, you don't want the failure to occur so that G1 and G2 are both asserted, these are signals, so that these two lights go on, that's an unsafe situation. On the other hand, R1 and R2 both asserted the two signals, that's a safe failure. It's uh, inconvenient, but it doesn't cause any crashes. Okay, so we sort of uh, form this logical expression. So remember, R, A, G, these are signals that turn on the lights, okay? So if the signal that turns on amber one 
or green one is asserted at the same time as amber two or green two, this is an unsafe condition. And we better detect that and set a safety flip-flop. So the safety flip-flop is set if ever, for whatever reason, A1 or G1 is asserted at the same time as A2 or G2. Okay? So let's lowercase g1 be the computer. Now, these traffic lights nowadays have complicated algorithms uh, controlling them. So typically, traffic lights uh, are connected to sensors that sense the presence of cars in various lanes, uh, buttons that pedestrians may have pressed, and so on. And that information comes in and given to an algorithm, an algorithm runs, and based on those inputs, conditions on the road, uh, existence of pedestrians, and so on, uh, computes what needs to be done. And of course, there are time limits, so when the green one turns on, maybe after 30 seconds, it has to be turned off, and the other road be given a chance to cars on the other road be given a chance to pass, and so on. So there's a complicated algorithm that runs and basically computes G1, meaning that green light 1 should be on. So this is the output of the algorithm. This is the signal that actually turns the light on. It's given to the light and turns it on. So the signal that turns uh, the green light 1 on will be one when these three conditions are satisfied. First of all, the algorithm says that that light should be on. That's an essential requirement. The algorithm, based on the inputs provided to it, says that that light should be on. But that's not enough. We also check to see that the safety flip-flop is not set. Because if the safety flip-flop is set during to a safety violation, then we don't want this green light to turn on. And just to be sure this is redundant, uh, we turn green light one on if amber light two or green light two is not turned on, okay? It shouldn't be turned on if our algorithm is correct, but just in case, that this signal, let's say, is stuck at 1, it may be, so if this is stuck at 1, it may be, basically, it will be asserted permanently, so when this one is asserted, we have a safety problem, okay? So we double check here. So th these are examples of interlocks. We, we assert this signal only if it should be asserted according to our algorithm, but that's not enough. But we also check various safety conditions to make sure that it's, it's a good idea to turn this on. Of course, traffic lights nowadays is much more complicated than just having these lights. There are pedestrian signals. Uh, uh, some, at some intersections, there are special bicycle signals and so on. But you get you know, the point of safety here. We have to uh, make sure that these unsafe conditions do uh, never occur. So we have to use interlocks and safety checks. Okay, we can design fail-safe combinational logic. Uh, and the ideas are very similar to uh, the self-checking uh, design that we covered earlier. Okay, so I won't discuss this much. Uh, j just give you an example. So this is a fail-safe uh, two out of four uh, code checker. What does a two out of four code checker do? Well, a two out of four code checker receives four bits at input, A, B, C, D, and it checks to see that two out of the four inputs are one. So the valid codes that come in will have two ones among the four bits. 
Anything else is invalid. Okay? So the output should be 0, 1, or 1, 0 if the input is one of these valid codes. Remember I said you have to have two outputs. You can't have one. So these two combinations of outputs, 0, 1, and 1, 0, tell us that everything is okay here. Okay, 0, 0 is a safe erroneous output, so it's okay to get 0, 0 at the output. That's considered safe. But you never want to get 1, 1 at the output. That's unsafe. The mechanism shown here basically detects the safety violation. If you have 1, 1, so these are the two parts of the circuit that compute to outputs. If we don't put those, connect those directly to the output, we have the safety mechanism here. If 1, 1 occurs for whatever reason, for example, this line being stuck at 1, so you're supposed to have 0, 1 here, but this line is stuck at 1, so you get 1, 1. If that occurs, then this flip-flop is reset. If that flip-flop is reset, the outputs, the two outputs become 0, 0. Okay? So we preset this flip-flop at the beginning, set, and therefore the output is simply forwarded. The output generated by these circuits is simply forwarded to the outputs. But if that unsafe condition ever occurs, this flip-flop is reset, and from that point on, we just don't trust the circuit, and therefore we produce 0, 0 at the output. Okay, we can also design fail-safe state machines or sequential machines. And here is a simple example. It's a five-state machine with state table given here. There's one input, and then these are the next states according to what the input is. We encode the states in binary, so state 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and also encode it in burger code. Remember, burger code uh, is a code that attaches to the main data the number of zeros that it has. So in this case, 0, 0, 1 has two zeros. So this 2, 1, 0 indicates that there are two zeros. Okay, 1, 0, 1 has 1, 0, so you have 0, 1 here. Okay, and uh, the design strategy that is listed here, I won't read uh, the details to you, ensures that such a sequential machine with uh, states encoded using burger code and with the next state logic equations implemented in a certain way that is specified here will be safe for all unidirectional errors. And no matter how many unidirectional, how many errors, provided they are unidirectional, occur, this system never goes into an incorrect state. So these are the states of the system. So 0, 0, 1, 1, 0 is a valid state. 0, 1, 0, 1, 0 is a valid state. If something goes wrong, it may go into an invalid state. It never goes to an incorrect state. But it always goes into an invalid state. So for example, if you go into state 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, it's not a valid state. And once it gets into an invalid state, it stays into an invalid state. In other words, further transitions never take it back to one of these valid states. And therefore, those are basically safe states. You can tell that something is wrong, and you don't trust the output of this sequential machine. OK. OK, I'm going to skip uh, a few slides here in order to cover some of this appendix. And the appendix I will cover very briefly. Uh, you can read it on your own. There's some interesting stuff there. For example, there is uh, historically, you know, the first fault tolerant computer was one of the first computers actually built. 
by a fellow named Antonin Svoboda in Czechoslovakia. Uh, Svoboda later actually immigrated to the U.S. and was a faculty member uh, at UCLA when he passed away in 1980. Uh, so he built, he led a team that built the SAPO, SAPO computer that was used triplication and voting. And they were motivated in those days by the fact that, you know, the Czech army uh, was in a war. So uh, they sort of used all the good dependable components that manufacturers in the country could build for building military systems. So university researchers such as Svoboda were left with sort of, you know, parts, components that uh, were very low quality. In other words, they didn't pass the quality test of the army, so they were just given to others. And they were so low quality that if they built the computer with those components, it would not work. So they used triplication to overcome the effect of these highly unreliable components. Another early computer that was fault tolerant uh, was the JPL uh, STAR computer. Uh, STAR stood for self-testing and repairing computer. And it, it was a research prototype uh, intended for use. It was never actually used on, on a spacecraft was intended for use for long duration missions, such as 10 year missions uh, exploring the solar system. So it has to had to last for 10 years uh, with its functionality intact. Of course, this prototype was huge, would not fit uh, on a spacecraft, but eventually they planned to shrink the size by putting all these components and chips uh, so that they would fit uh, in a spacecraft. Okay, then I have a bunch of slides that uh, sort of uh, list the main events in each of the decades since the 1950s, and I'm going to just step through them, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, 2010, some of the key events that occurred in the history of dependable computing in those deca decades. Then the next three sections of the appendix, which I'm also going to skip, uh, describe some examples uh, from three categories of systems uh, that we in the field of dependable computing deal with. Uh, long life systems, this is such as the star computer, a computer is designed to have a long life so that they can operate for that period of time without a need for repair. Uh, safety critical systems, these are systems that are used for applications in which uh, safety uh, is at issue and therefore they have to be highly reliable, at least safe if not highly reliable, such as uh, uh, flight control systems, or uh, automobile or high-speed train control systems. And finally, high availability systems. These are the type of systems used by e-commerce sites. Uh, they don't want the system to be unavailable even for a short duration of time because that will mean uh, loss of revenue and also loss of trust on the part of the customers. Okay, so tandem, on-stop computers and Google data center are examples of these. And of course, nowadays we have dependability feature also in just regular computers or even personal systems. So sort of the methods that are used initially for those high reliability, high safety and uh, highly available systems 
trickle down and are used eventually on just regular computers that we use daily. Okay. All right. The last section of the appendix, um, I have listed here seven challenges that we are going to be facing in the 2020s and beyond. And each of these challenges is, so I'm not going to go through these because there are slides for each of these challenges coming up. So I'll just show you one slide for each of those and describe. So the curse of shrinking electronic devices. Uh, you know, nanotechnology has caused devices to shrink. Uh, and uh, as the devices shrink, they become less and less reliable due to manufacturing problems. And therefore, we have to come up with new methods, both in terms of redundancy. Uh, some of the area power gains from shrinkage, making things smaller, must be reinvested in reliability feature. So, for example, we may have to triplicate or even have a higher number of copies of circuits in order to ensure reliable operation. Circuit modeling becomes more difficult and testing, of course, becomes very challenging. So that's the first challenge the curse of shrinking electronic devices. And this is a um, quantum cellular automata, which is one of the new technologies that uh, we are hoping to use in future. OK. Uh, nowadays, a lot of things we put in the cloud, that, that has an upside because we sort of uh, offload uh, the problems of maintenance and so on to somebody else. But it also brings with it uh, challenges in terms of data security and reliability. So when we put all of our data in the cloud, then we essentially lose control over it. And uh, depending on how secure the cloud is, you know, other people may gain access to it. And also, the reliability of the cloud is now beyond our control. Of course, you know, cloud operators promise high reliability, but whether it uh, can be trusted uh, in this promise is uh, an open question at this point. OK, the third challenge is designing systems to be smarter and lower power. And in this, we sort of we have started uh, mimicking uh, the systems and processes in the human brain because the human brain is highly energy efficient. Human brain uh, consumes roughly uh, on the order of 20 watts of power, whereas microprocessor chips nowadays, the high power chips, uh, consume on the order of 200 watts of power. And then we have to put many of these chips together to build a supercomputer that can do some of the things that our brain does. So uh, the brain is orders of magnitude more energy efficient than the supercomputers that we use nowadays. And therefore, learning about how the brain does various functions is very important in the hopes of being able to mimic those processes. This is sometimes referred to as brain-inspired computing, using methods similar to the brain to achieve energy efficiency and also lower algorithmic complexity. Because when we look at the face of someone, we very quickly recognize who that person is, if we know the person. Whereas similar algorithms for doing face recognition take a lot of compute power. OK. Ensuring data longevity is another challenge that we face. Uh, of course, nowadays, uh, 
computers become obsolete so quickly that before data becomes obsolete, we tend to move to another computer and copy our data. So our data really does not become obsolete because it moves from system to system. But imagine, you know, now nowadays uh, we have books from thousands of years ago, okay, handwritten books that have survived. Will our data today survive a thousand, two thousand years from today? Uh, well, we have to sort of work on it and make sure that it survives. Uh, sometimes the data itself survives. So if you have one of these uh, old floppy disks, okay, the data on the floppy disk may survive, even, even though it has a limited time span. But if you have one of those floppy disks at home right now, and you just kept it uh, as a souvenir, uh, there's no floppy disk reader that you can put this into and read the data. So survival of data on the medium is one thing, and being able to read that data off the medium is another thing. Okay, there's this encyclopedia article that I wrote uh, a year or so ago that discusses this issue of data longevity. If you are interested in looking at it, you can get a PDF copy from, from my publications page. Oops. Okay, an important point is that Failures and intrusions sometimes interact. In fact, one of the common ways that hackers, intruders, uh, try to take over systems is by taking advantage of failures. So we have all these uh, security software running on our system. So under normal conditions, the, if the security software is well designed, you know, it will prevent hackers from from gaining access. But if a failure ha occurs in the system, then all bets are off because the system will start behaving unpredictably and there's no guarantee that the same, same security mechanisms will work on a failed system as they work on a, a normal system. So this, this is really important to so to make sure that the system is still secure even when failures occur in it. A reliability wall, I won't discuss the details in this slide, just mention what it is. Uh, you may have heard of the notion of memory wall. Memory wall basically is a concept that says uh, the performance of our highest performing systems nowadays nowadays is limited by memory rather than processor. So we can make our processors faster and use more processors to improve the computing power, but often the performance of the overall system is limited by the memory uh, access speed and bandwidth, not by the processor. So the same thing has been observed for reliability. In other words, we can make our systems bigger, use more processor to improve uh, the processing power. However, as the number of components, number of processors, amount of memory increases, then failures become more likely. You know, the more components you have, the more parts you have, the more failures you can expect. And therefore, reliability also erects a wall on the path to gaining higher performance. So let me leave this at that. So uh, there is memory wall and there's reliability wall that basically prevent us from uh, improving the performance and capabilities of the systems uh, beyond a certain limit. Okay, this is a timeline. Uh, it's incomplete at this point. Uh, I will be working on completing this timeline. Uh, some key events in the history of dependable computing are listed here. In particular, the first conference uh, 
in the field, Fault Tolerant Computing Symposium, what was held in 1971, the first, and the 50th, we just held that. Uh, so there is a sort of a history of 50 years in holding these fault tolerant computing conferences every year. Uh, we now have a journal, IEEE Transactions and Dependable and Secure Systems, that started uh, pub being published in 2004, and so on. So I will complete this and uh, provide some other uh, additional milestones in the history of dependable computing. These are some resources. Uh, the conference that I mentioned is now called Dependable Systems and Networks. It changed name. It has a website that leads you to the latest conference and also has a section that you can access the information about previous conferences. The next one of in the series uh, 2021 will be in Taipei, European Dependable Computing Conference, Pacific Rim Symposium on Dependable Computing. So these are three main conferences. SafeComp is another conference, not as prominent as the other three. It, uh, it focuses on safety and security. IEEE Transaction on Dependable and Secure Computing I already mentioned. And there's also an IFIP Working Group 10.4. IFIP stands for uh, international Federation for Information Processing. It's an international body that maintains a working group uh, in dependable computing, sponsors conferences, and other uh, projects. Okay, the final slide for the course um, is intended to show you that in this course, we built a framework. In other words, we covered a lot of things and we sort of related all these different concepts together, in effect, building a framework. And we supplied some details in some cases. Okay, for example, I mentioned in the case of coding that you can uh, talk for weeks, an entire semester about coding methods. So I gave you the basics and then in the course of your career, if you ever encounter a uh, need for designing systems that are highly dependable, this framework will serve you well, well, but you may have to go and fill in some details that we did not cover in this course for the particular purpose you know, that you have uh, in your job or uh, in your project. Okay, so we skimmed over a number of applicable techniques, and you should now be ready to pursue some of the details uh, as the need arises. You know, there's no point in learning all the details that you're not going to use uh, in your work. But you have the basics, you have the structure, you have the terminology to be able to talk about these concepts and relate them to each other. Okay, so this concludes uh, the course uh, ECE 257A, um, Fault Tolerant Computing or Dependable Computing. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the course and learned uh, from it. Every time I teach this course, I learn new stuff myself because when I update the slides or the textbook or read the new publications, you know, IEEE transactions of dependable secure systems, the various conferences that I mentioned. Every year new ideas are presented and, uh, and some of them are incorporated in my textbook and slides. Uh, you know, one has to, in any field of computing nowadays, you know, things move very fast and you have to keep up to date by consulting uh, the literature, uh, whether conference proceedings or journals to make sure that you are up to date. Okay, 
good luck in using this material in your work and uh, bye for now.